turn it over to Adam and so he can share his screen with you and get started. Thank you, Adam. Thanks so much, Jay, and uh, it's a, a great privilege uh, to be here. Uh, you guys can see my slide deck, hopefully. Uh, let me know if not. Um, and as Jay mentioned, um, you know, we have been partnering um, closely with uh, Casey and his team at the Data Lab. And today, I wanted to go through really um, the odyssey of uh, our efforts, not just um, uh, right now in the context of the Data Lab, but how we got here, where we're trying to head, and how we're trying to really iterate on new models of discovery and accelerated research, uh, particularly in the context of pediatric brain tumors. Um, so pediatric brain tumors really present um, a tremendous challenge on a global scale. Um, the landscape within the United States really uh, is such that and most people don't recognize this, but pediatric brain tumors are the most common cause of cancer-related death in children. But this is true um, in a variety of different contexts uh, that, that span into the young adult age. Um, there are more than 4,000 children and young adults are diagnosed with brain tumors every single year. Um, the median age for across uh, these patients is only nine years old for those who succumb to their disease. Um, and in totality, on a yearly basis, there are more than 14,000 children that are currently living with brain tumors. But this is not just a U.S. problem, um, and it turns out that the, this primacy of, um, of leading disease-related death in children is shared amongst you know, the entire world's context, and every country you see here and many more are facing the same challenge. And as such, this really creates a global uh, challenge. Um, and as challenging as it might be to, um, uh, within the United States, it's even more challenging in many other places to really drive change and impact on behalf of children um, who are suffering from pediatric brain tumors. And so for us, open PBTA is really uh, an experiment. Um, and I say that in, in ways that perhaps is a disclaimer in that it's still an ongoing experiment, an ongoing initiative in which we are continuing to iterate on how it is that we can change that landscape, both here in the United States and uh, beyond uh, our borders. And the challenge really centers on this concept of an experiment. Um, you know, I was trained as a traditional scientist, uh, really as a neuroscientist. I did my graduate training uh, in very traditional fashion at Johns Hopkins and really began as a PhD, um, you know, searching to, to drive change in the context of pediatric brain tumors. Um, and this is the model of research that I was really trained in, uh, the scientific method of, of creating observations, testing hypotheses, performing experiments, and iterating on the conclusion that those experiments drive. Here you see Galileo's leading tower pizza, where essentially he's you know, testing his hypothesis on the effects of gravity in ways that are invariant of shape. And so this is really not unique to those of us in graduate school, but whether you're in first, second, sixth, twelfth grade, this concept of how to do science um, as driven by the scientific method is drilled into you from the very beginning. And for those of you who don't recall, I'm sure pictures like this might um, provide some, uh, uh, some memory. Uh, but it's actually very challenging to simply take these sets of boxes and implement them on behalf of pediatric cancer and pediatric brain tumors. And so this is me uh, and the ID badge that actually I still carry from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and my arrival here in 2007. And I was a very naive um, uh, you know, scientist at that time coming to CHOP, um, really wanting to do research in this fashion. But at the time, you know, I rapidly faced a challenge, um, which was that at the time there were no large scale NIH initiatives focused on brain tumors. And it was very challenging to even begin to ask the right questions or form the hypothesis or do the experiments. And part of this challenge is that although pediatric brain tumors are the leading cause of disease related death in children, thankfully, most children are healthy. And so, Pediatric brain tumors and most cancers in children are still classified as rare. 
The rare is an arbitrary term, but in this context, what it really means is that even at a place like CHOP or any other um, uh, hospital system, it is very challenging to get access to sufficient number of specimens, sufficient number of data sets or tissues to perform these initial steps of the scientific method. And so um, I actually also ended up being an English and literature major in college. Um, and myself and working with several partners at CHOP and then other uh, institutions began to really think about this scientific method challenge that we faced. Um, very much aligned to T.S. Eliot's sort of prescient characterization of um, something that's very close to the scientific method, but recognizes the difference uh, between uh, knowledge, information, uh, data, or here in this context, wisdom. Specifically, um, this actually ended up being, um, uh, T.S. Eliot actually wrote this in 1934 uh, before we even had ways of measuring information. Um, the concept of the bit essentially uh, didn't come along until um, uh, later uh, mid-century. But this concept of uh, data to information to knowledge to understanding actually became um, you know, fairly well established, especially in the 1980s, as a methodology for thinking about the flow and the handoffs that are required between um, these concepts of data, information, and knowledge, and what it really means to transform data into information um, and information into knowledge and its use. And as we began to iterate on this concept, you know, we really began aligning that methodology uh, to the scientific method. And it was clear that in order to create observation hypothesis and experiments, we had to solve this data or information or knowledge gap if we actually wanted to get to impact, if we wanted to actually translate efforts into that context. And so to provide some context for the definitional space, data is really raw data. So you can imagine here in this context, um, you know, sequencing a tumor and generating the first genomic sequence from that tumor. And that genomic sequence, in order to actually be interpretable or queryable, you have to harmonize that genomic sequence to other sequences. You have to apply some standards to it that initially allow you to penetrate uh, really what is in that sequence. That on its own does not provide you knowledge. Knowledge is really taking that information and going through the process of experimentation or analysis such that you can interpret what it means to have that sequence. And then obviously the impact is the space where you then can act upon that meaning uh, on behalf of altering the course of the biological context. But above this pathway, you can see here something that you know, I alluded to earlier, which is any one scientist at any one institution that's bounded by their laboratory or their institutions has a, a tremendous challenge generating enough data to actually transform it into meaningful knowledge, um, in part because we have to think of this as a global challenge. And so if you actually want to one, even perform um, experiments, and then secondarily, if you layer on that the mandate to actually accelerate um, the impact that you're trying to get to. You have to really reconceptualize how to do this um, process in ways that I think, you know, Access and Nathan Foundation, the Data Lab, and many others are really driving um, ultimate change. And here I just have, you know, the equation for acceleration. I always remind myself that um, it's really, if you want to accelerate um, by definition uh, here, Newtonian, you actually have to drive change or change the velocity across the time. And critically, time is the variable that in the translational context, if we want to have meaningful impact on patients, we have to optimize for. So the question ends up being, how do we drive this impact in the shortest amount of time with limited local uh, resources? And so this is where the birth of the pediatric brain tumor resource and ATLAS initiative really began to form with the idea that we need to think of patients beyond our own hospital uh, system, to think about a network of hospitals that have to be connected in um, near real time to platforms that support that data to information process 
and that this had to then be further underpinned by human um, partnerships um, that harness knowledge and expertise across very um, broad spaces of um, scientific uh, knowledge. Specifically, um, you know, throughout the entire process, and every patient family knows this, um, when you are dealing with, let's say, pediatric brain tumors, even as a family, you end up spanning a whole set of expertise with highly specialized people who have spent their entire lives um, learning and improving the application of radiology or, or um, diagnostics or surgery, surgery or chemotherapy. But it's really putting those systems together um, that drives the ultimate care of the patient. And likewise, on a scientific side, it's really bringing together very diverse expertise from the molecular biologist to the genomicist to the proteomicist to the data scientist to the clinicians, um, all together around a patient's uh, data-driven care um, that requires uh, us to coordinate these activities uh, if we are to actually drive that accelerated impact. And so the Children's Brain Tumor Tissue Consortium, um, as it was first known um, more recently, um, it was transformed to the Children's Brain Tumor Network. So you'll see both actually highlighted, both names utilized throughout this presentation as we're rolling out um, the, uh, the change in name. And it'll make sense uh, as we move forward. Really began as initially four institutions um, that uh, really wanted to drive that biospecimen to data uh, generation context. And we began the consortium in 2013, initially with four institutions. Um, and today, uh, we span almost more than 30 institutions. And what I'll walk you through is really this uh, timeline of efforts and then point you through to some of the resources um, and products of these efforts in ways that we hope to engage you and the rest of the community in partnership uh, even beyond. Um, this initial consortia-based efforts. And so we launched a consortium in 2013 with the idea that if we could actually bring together um, as a centralized resource source, the biospecimen associated clinical data, the longitudinal clinical data, the MRIs, the pathology slides, we could create that data resource such that any scientist um, could come to work on pediatric brain tumors. And that was the goal. In fact, that's a major challenge still today that there aren't enough pediatric brain tumor scientists in general to solve the myriad of challenges and across the myriad of histologies that exist within pediatric brain tumors. But 2013 was a start. Um, and today, there are more than 21 institutions who are part of the uh, Children's Brain Tumor Network um, that span essentially the United States across both coasts, um, as well as in Europe, Asia and Australia, all committing to the development of this resource as a global resource. So, and what I mean by that is that the specimens and data sets are not only available to the institutions who are contributing those, but to anybody who actually um, wants to use these specimens. And over the last several years, this specimen and biorepository and data resource has further expanded its relationships with clinical trial networks, uh, especially with the Pacific Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Consortium, where large-scale data sets and biospecimens can drive the preclinical work and clinical trial development area such that they feed into new clinical trials and, and vice versa. Those clinical trials generate data sets and biospecimens that feed back into the consortium context, creating um, what we really think is the world's largest pediatric brain tumor resource um, supporting research. So today we have more than 3,000 patients enrolled with longitudinal clinical data in the Children's Brain Tumor Tissue Consortium or Children's Brain Tumor Tissue Network. Um, this spans more than 30,000 biospecimens um, that essentially uh, span uh, fresh frozen tissue, DMSO frozen tissue, so you can generate cell lines or preclinical models, as well as derivatives of the tissue like RNA and DNA uh, and protein for various assays. We've also been curating and developing preclinical models with more than 70 uh, of these. These end up being the environment or the resource 
that allows for drug testing or CRISPR knockouts or any of the other types of efforts that really drive accelerated clinical translation. And the Brain Tumor Tissue um, uh, Atlas initiative uh, really was spawned by the sequencing of 1,000 of these more than 3,000 patients. So it's only uh, a little bit less than a third of the patients that are currently enrolled that are characterized by 1,000 whole genomes and RNA-seq RNA -seq, uh, sequences are, represents, uh, to our knowledge, one of the largest um, molecular data sets ever created on behalf of pediatric brain tumors to date. I think there's less than you know, a couple hundred uh, patient-specific uh, data uh, within NIH resources. Um, and so this really represents a tremendous um, community-led effort uh, to drive the generation of large-scale data. These have then intersected with an NCI and NIH-based efforts to layer on top of the whole genome and RNA-C context uh, proteomic data, as well as very soon single cell uh, or single MOOC RNA-seq data sets, creating really a very rich multi-layered uh, data set for these uh, patients. And for us, this began addressing that first challenge of data. How can we move from biospecimens to data as a starting point in that value chain um, on behalf of creating information? And again, at each step, I have to be transparent, although as you prepare a presentation, you put it together on a slide deck that makes it seem like you uh, preconceived and designed this rationally. Um, there's always an iterative process in optimizing how we go from collection to annotation to curation to QC to generating these data sets, and then ultimately driving the informational context. It became clear that this more than three petabytes of data that was generated um, was an incredibly rich uh, resource. One that exceeded the capacity of CHOP or any one institution just to analyze. And so very early in, we began looking at how do we create cloud-based infrastructure that can support the access and use of these um, data sets. And I'll just briefly highlight a couple of these. Um, uh, to show you uh, where things stand and how uh, anyone can access these data um, and connect that to the concept I'm trying to uh, elucidate here um, and the still remaining challenges and opportunities I hope uh, the audience will further engage with us. So Kabatica is a cloud-based workspace environment. So each time you generate a whole genome or any sequence, in order to convert it, from data to information, you have to process that. And this requires significant compute and analysis and workflows. And if you actually even want to recreate or reproduce these initial uh, processes, um, you have to implement those same workflows in a routine way. Um, the Gabriella Miller Kids First Data Resource Portal um, is actually an NIH-funded environment um, that uh, not only hosts the Pediatric Brain Tumor uh, Atlas data sets, but uh, importantly, many other data sets. And that's a critical factor that I'll get to later. And that is that in any discovery effort, um, what we have seen is that in order to maximize uh, the interpretation of that information that you're trying to generate, um, you need to contextualize it in as broad a biological context as possible. And then we partnered with um, Dana Farber, Princess Margaret, and MSK to further iterate on a very um, uh, often used um, environment called CBIO portal, which really is, is an environment that takes the output of activities in Kavatica, the, the processing of the data, um, and provides a way to query that initial process data. And I'll show you that uh, briefly, briefly. So let me uh, switch screens just so I can highlight um, some of these platforms largely to provide you a context for how we're trying to solve um, that data to information phase. So the Kids First uh, portal is an environment that any user uh, can actually log into. Um, and this is myself. And when you first log in, you'll come to your own uh, environment. Um, and you can explore any data set that's in the Kids First portal. 
Um, but as I mentioned, um, you know, we were able to leverage uh, the, the building and construction of um, the Kids First data resource and really partner with the NIH to iterate on how to optimize building a portal environment to allow users to initially identify data sets um, around pediatric brain tumors. And so um, you can see the pediatric brain tumor atlas is available here. And this is that first thousand or so subjects that I described coming out of the CBTN. And if I apply that filter, we can immediately see that there are 917 participants with you know, a whole variety of different phenotypes, um, different data modalities, both RNA-seq uh, and, and whole genome data. And you can see some of the other metrics like demographics, the different histologies, um, different ages and so on. The portal is meant to support users who want access to the source data. So what this allows users to do is to create essentially your bag of data um, that you might want to use and analyze. Um, so users could, could also, for example, um, start a new query and say, I want to not only analyze brain tumors, but I'd like to also analyze um, neuroblastoma. And then I would like to uh, go to these more than 20,000 files that are available um, across neuroblastoma and brain tumors and then further iterate on the types of files and source data that I would like to analyze. So we've had people who essentially analyze the raw genomic data sets, people who are interested in um, uh, gaining access to uh, processed data that are available or other file formats that include, for example, the um, slide images from uh, pathology or the PDF reports coming from the hospital system, uh, so the pathology report or operative report um, for various analyses. This environment with your bag of data is a place where many users begin, um, but it's especially geared to one type of user, and that is the bioinformatic analysis analyst, which to be honest is not me. Remember, I was trained in the neurosciences, so someone like myself um, would be very challenged to start here and go all the way to the information and knowledge space. And that's the first important lesson uh, in this context is that it really requires combinations of teams. Um, yes, I, the scientist, can create the bag of data, but typically I would have to partner with other um, users and or experts to process that data. However, I could take that data um, here and create an environment where I could analyze that data. Oops, I think I clicked on the wrong ones. Sorry. Um, where I could actually analyze such data um, in an environment like Kavatica. So here, I'll, I'll just go to the Kavatica environment here. Now, once you click on the uh, user data that you're interested in working with and um, analyze the data in Kavatica, you're brought to an environment where you can actually have projects that uh, within those projects, you can actually invite your favorite bioinformaticians to come and work with you on that um, data set. And so I, as a biologist, can say, hey, I found this amazing data set, but I'd like to work with my favorite bioinformatician um, and invite them to come into this workspace. And furthermore, um, this is also the place where we began creating public projects, which I'll come back to at the very end, but wanted to highlight now that the open access data sets are also available here. Um, and I'll come back and reference them later. Someone like myself, as I mentioned, would begin as a scientist or a biologist in a, to query data sets after they've been processed in that initial space in an environment like CBioPortal. Um, here, you know, you can apply your domain expertise look for your favorite genes. So this is again, the Pediatric Brain Tumor Atlas Initiative, where all the process data, this initial provisional process data is available. Um, and I can look you know, to identify all the patients that might have a P53 mutation, um, and then look to see what other mutations they might have or other features of that cohort in a meaningful way. Let me come back to the slide deck.
So in many ways, and again, from a naive perspective, um, you know, our consortia-based efforts and uh, initiatives really thought that this is what it would take to drive change, that delta, that we've began generating large sets of data set of data, created environments where users could access the source data, could process that data, created initial environments where people could peruse or ask questions from the gene-centric view or patient-centric view. Um, but the reality uh, was that it did um, drive that process in a significant way, but to a, an extent that we want to drive further. And I'll give you an example here. So for us, it was phenomenal that we um, had, you know, over the course of less than a year, more than 100 investigators um, essentially access um, the raw genomic data sets. More than thousands of investigators um, um, began using the process data. Um, and more than 60 investigators actually uh, applied and um, uh, received um, samples from the biorepository. And again, um, you know, these numbers for, for us as a community are phenomenal because, you know, they're there are less than, you know, 100 probably pediatric brain tumor investigators um, or PIs in the United States who are focused solely on pediatric brain tumors. Um, so having these types of numbers um, is really phenomenal. Um, but when you start thinking about the number of different histologies um, that you're trying to address, and you can see this here, you start recognizing that if you start splitting these investigators across the different histologies, it's still a small number of investigators. Um, and our goal should be not just to serve those who know they want to study pediatric brain tumors, but to expand this community um, to hopefully some of you who are on the call uh, and beyond that context. And the way to do that is to drive knowledge creation. Um, one way that, you know, I, I like to characterize it in, in a sort of a, an analogy is that, um, you know, when any one of us um, is creating a meal, um, if we were forced to go and fetch the eggs from a chicken uh, to cook our eggs, very few of us would be eating eggs. And so, you know, for us to actually cook, most of us, I suspect, to cook a meal, like we rely on a whole value chain that gets us the eggs uh, in a simple way that then we can cook the meal. And we can iterate um, on the meals that we cook. Um, you don't have to be an egg aficionado and they there are people who are like that. There are chefs who are experts, but even non-experts can cook eggs if you make the eggs available, available to them in an easy and uh, approachable way. And this is what I'm trying to hint at, um, that even as you lower the bar for access to raw genomic data, you're still required to work across a very diverse landscape of investigators to continue pushing that data to information and ultimately to knowledge. And this is really where um, we found keen partnership and opportunity um, with uh, the data lab, as uh, Jay mentioned. Because it turns out that going from data to information to knowledge to impact is not as simple as T.S. Eliot um, thought, and it's not his fault. And that's because each one of these spaces, these lines that separate data to information, information to knowledge, and knowledge to impact. One, they're not unidirectional, so they're iterative. But two, almost always, there's a change in domain expertise and the kind of people and their specific knowledge, even independent of a specific disease that's required. And so it's really a digital and non-local community that connected through platforms and performing the actual knowledge creation together that will opt optimally drive change um, in the time variable of interest. And this is supported by platforms that integrate across these efforts, but also a community-based approach to knowledge creation. And so OpenPBTA is an experiment, but really it's a new way for rapid knowledge creation to take that information um, context and drive iterative knowledge that can be a starting point for expanding the network of those who actually intersect 
with that knowledge. So you don't have to be a brain tumor scientist or a pediatric brain tumor scientist to intersect with that knowledge because knowledge spills over across different domains um, and disease contexts. And so this is where the Open PBTA um, initiative uh, and our partnership with Casey uh, Green and the Data Lab really had its genesis. And in part, it's because of the Data Lab's sort of visionary approach to um, thinking about knowledge creation. Specifically, um, uh, and this may have been introduced in uh, some previous lectures, but specifically what they have done is brought to the knowledge creation context, the open software context, uh, leveraging um, really GitHub. Uh, and for those of you who are not GitHub aficionados, it's actually a fairly um, intuitive uh, environment. And, and to be honest, most basic scientists or biologists don't intersect with GitHub because it's a software development arena. But a, a truly intuitive uh, way that does that iterative cycles um, I mentioned before, that iterative cycle between information and knowledge um, in a way that's very thoughtful. And so here you can see this schema where a project in this context, the Open PBTA, is created and where various users are intersecting to create knowledge through specific analyses. Um, and those analyses and their outputs are iteratively integrated through um, a context of what's called a pull request and then emerging into essentially a um, master uh, branch, as it were, of the analysis. And I'll go through that in just a second. But this complicated graph, all it's really doing is saying, I'm going to harness the expertise of different users who are interested in performing different analyses to drive new knowledge creation, but do it in a coordinated way, in a transparent and reproducible way that can then intersect into a combined knowledge space. And to my knowledge, um, this has not been done before in this way uh, when it comes to pediatric cancers, and likely very uh, um, uh, infrequently in the context of almost any other uh, scientific endeavor. Again, historically, we work within our institutional boundaries. And even if we're willing to share data, that sharing is a transactional activity as opposed to a collaborative activity. So for example, and I'll show you in a second, when you go to the GitHub open PBTA environment, you'll see transparently um, all the proposed analysis. And anybody can propose an analysis. Anybody can actually perform an analysis. Um, and then those analyses can be integrated into this living context of um, shared understanding. And I'll switch screen again just to show you um, that view. So we can just go to the, to the open PBT analysis um, uh, with under the github.com Alex Lemonade open PBT analysis. And you'll see right away um, a list of activities. And right below, you'll see um, you know, a more um, concrete description of the effort, um, really highlighting um, the, our efforts to fully convert these uh, thousand or so subjects data sets into meaningful results. And importantly, you can see that um, what as a community, and it's not just us, um, are proposing to do. Um, so anybody can actually propose, and, and uh, I'll pause briefly to thank all of those uh, who may be listening who um, have proposed uh, analyses on these data sets. Um, and you, at the same time, can actually also look at these analyses and specifically their results. So for example, one analysis here is the immune deconvolution. I can see that Jacqueline actually um, uh, submitted this issue here from the data lab. And the very important part of this process um, as supported by the, by the data lab is that um, the process of doing the analysis in order to integrate into the workflow has to be reproducible. Um, so each layer of code and analysis that, that extracts meaning from a particular data set. So for example, here, the immune context of an RNA-seq. Um, not only um, could Jacqueline run this workflow, but anybody 
can actually take the exact same workflow and come up with the exact same answer, and more importantly, with the exact same plots. So for example, here, I'll just show you briefly, um, uh, and you can iterate uh, on this, uh, but um, you'll see just a, a brief preview. Um, here is th this initial output um, and clustering of the immune context based on RNA-seq uh, for the PBTA. This process of creating analyses and figures and knowledge um, in ways that are fully transparent uh, pre-publication um, as a community um, is a remarkably, at least for someone like myself, innovative way to drive that accelerated impact. And I'll show you um, in what ways I think this is um, meaningful uh, in just a second. So as I mentioned, um, anybody can actually go to the OpenPBTA analysis GitHub repo um, and then um, analyze it. So I know I went through a variety of different portals and environments and to try and tie this together, uh, let me read just briefly encapsulate uh, these together. So we knew that users would want access to data. You know, we've managed to create an open science repository of biospecimens, uh, managed to at least sequence and characterize um, in, uh, to some extent, you know, about a third of these specimens. Uh, but we knew that we had to provide a way for people to find and create their bags of data um, that they might want to utilize. And this is especially true for data scientists and bioinformaticians um, as informed by um, uh, domain expertise working with biologists or clinicians. That bag of data can then be analyzed and, um, uh, and processed um, in ways that convert it from uh, really data to information, um, that first alignment um, or even um, variant call space um, can be done across domains like Cavatica and then even queried in the context of PC BioPortal. But if you ask me, how does PC BioPortal help the next patient uh, who comes through CHOP's doors? That's the space where I would feel uncomfortable because I wouldn't be able to say to you, um, how can I position the next patient's whole genome or RNA-seq data in the context of all of the open PBTA data set? And that's the important transition that happens once you start analyzing the data. That's where knowledge comes in because then I could take the immune profile of any one patient that comes through CHOPS doors and position it in context against all of the knowledge created by workflows in OpenBBTA. And I'll show you what that looks like um, here. So I'm gonna switch screen one more time. Oh, sorry. There we go. So here's actually an environment where um, we've taken all of the open PBTA immune profiles and um, they are arrayed here as box plots. So each one of these box and uh, dots represent all the patients in the open PBTA. And this red dot is a specific patient, a patient actually in a clinical trial. And so you can take that knowledge space, right? And begin to understand that this patient compared to all other patients has different immune cell context. You can see here, right? The adipocytes or the HSC cell content or even the melanocytes, any of these cell types as predicted by an immune deconvolution workflow um, can be essentially interpreted in context. And once you do that, then a clinician can begin understanding and interpret um, that specific patient data set. And for, for me, this is really a, a fulfillment um, as a scientist. And I think it's true for every one of us in the pediatric cancer landscape of of a vision of taking a data-driven approach that begins as a partnership with patients who um, 
you know, enroll in a biorepository initiative um, and ends with patients um, who are counting on us to provide them new avenues for the interpretation of their specific tumor. So. And it's a phenomenal story. And, and again, uh, I'm highlighting that, you know, the open PBTA analysis is still ongoing. Um, and there are still broken pieces, things that need to be fixed, issues that need to be resolved, um, branches that need to be um, uh, merged. Um, but I wanted to highlight this vignette uh, of the opportunities that uh, come to fruition when you engage a community based approach in more real time, um, disconnected from the traditional practices of um, uh, individual investigators or scientists working as indep independent agents within a particular institution. Um, and the part that I hinted uh, toward throughout the presentation, which is that we need more of those independent investigators overall, um, not only to work together, but just in general, the total number of investigators um, itself to work in pediatric cancer um, also gets um, repositioned as part of the open PBT initiative. I think that for me this was you know a thrill only a few weeks old um, where essentially uh, you know on uh, a meeting that was ostensibly about something else actually uh, with one of our collaborators um, at Mount Sinai, Abi Mayan, um, he actually introduced us to Nicole um, Moisa Yeb, um, and she is actually a second year undergraduate uh, student um, who was spending time in uh, Avi's lab uh, just for the summer. And like most bioinformatic environments, and Avi's is a bioinformatic laboratory, um, they often focus, and you can see it here, on the TCGA. This is the large scale adult cancer data sets that has really transformed the way science is done and where we are trying to model many of our efforts. But uh, Nicole, the minute she found out that um, OpenPPTA had processed data um, and matrices, uh, took the work that she began working on in uh, the open, in the context of the TCGA and again, uh, I'm a trained neuroscientist, so I, I couldn't necessarily um, deconvolute for you the entire um, here Jupyter Notebook code. Uh, but she began actually taking this open PBTA context of the data and immediately, right, by just taking um, the files that are available as part of the open PBTA. So this PBTA stranded.csv is a file that's available on the GitHub repo. Um, and she could take that file and begin to actually end this file as well, right? She could just pull those files, right, using her notebook code and begin to iterate on the analysis um, from her own perspective, even as an undergraduate, in ways it was quite meaningful. In fact, um, very rapidly, and I'm gonna scroll down um, briefly, she could begin to cluster um, and explore the data. So here uh, she created a way to actually, and again, these are all field and analyses that were done under OpenPBTA, but she can actually begin to cluster and look at um, different tumor types um, as analyzed and defined by her own methods um, to further iterate on the knowledge of any one specific patient, but in the context of very many. And this is someone who has never touched or been informed about pediatric brain tumors, but because we've brought, in, because we brought the egg right, to her refrigerator, essentially, um, she's able to cook her omelet um, and drive uh, further knowledge and interpretation in ways that we hope then feeds right back into um, the data-driven process of discovery for patients. So again, um, you know, th this is still very much an ongoing experiment and we hope um, that those of you who are on the call um, will join, uh, inform, uh, make us better um, at uh, doing this because ultimately it's on behalf of patients and um, 
as we in our community, and this is true for brain tumors and beyond, we won't stop until every child is cured. And this, as far as I can tell, and I think many of you likely agree, um, depends on a data-driven approach um, that is accelerated. I'd especially like to thank uh, Casey and his team uh, in the data lab, especially Casey and Jacqueline and, and the rest. Um, they have been transformational, uh, not only for our team here at CHOP, but for many others in pushing and iterating uh, on how to drive knowledge creation uh, through an open science approach um, uh, and their efforts. And we wouldn't be anywhere near this space if it wasn't for their partnership in this context. And obviously, um, you know, I'm just a neuroscientist um, and all of this wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the amazing team uh, within the Center for Data Driven Discovery in Biomedicine and our consortia partners um, who have selflessly contributed uh, all the specimens in partnerships with patients and foundations who have sponsored most of the data generation I talked about today that is available for use right now. So thank you so much. And um, uh, again, uh, hopefully this can act as an engagement opportunity um, and please follow up with any questions or issues um, uh, with our team. Uh, we hold um, frequent uh, op open office hours around these platforms and can always facilitate access to data or support new projects associated with specimens within the biorepository of the CBTM. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, I appreciate the talk and I appreciate you sharing on how people can uh, get involved with, with the work that you're doing. Um, we're gonna go and see what questions we have now, if you have a few minutes to answer questions, okay? Of course. Okay. The first question we have comes in from Hendrik Lim. I know I've seen Hendrik on these talks before and his question is, what is the rationale you take for doing WGS and RNA-seq data from the same subjects uh, at the same time? Yeah, uh, so th this is not just my rationale. Um, you know, uh, early on, we actually um, essentially polled our community um, for what would be the most salient uh, data modality to generate um, that would drive initial interpretation. And because so little data had been generated or has been generated in pediatric brain tumors, in order to get a comprehensive view um, of the molecular landscape, we began with whole genome sequencing in RNA-seq, and that has ended up serving us incredibly well. Um, not only does it allow us to look at the potential mutational context of the tumor in coding and non-coding regions, but also um, integrate that with the um, so-called germline context. And then layered on top of this initial um, uh, genomic static view, um, is the expression or RNA-seq data for each one of those tumors that then allows us to interpret, for example, the immune context. It's also served as a layer upon which other data modalities that are, are, less, um, uh, uh, are less well harmonized across different groups, but which add additional meaning um, can be added. So for example, once you have the whole genome and expression data, um, you can layer on proteomic data or single cell uh, uh, analysis data. And that process has really proved um, useful in ways that we can then integrate um, with the molecular characterization workflows that are currently emerging in the clinical context. So the example I gave of a patient-specific analysis uh, is based on the fact that in that clinical trial, um, there's whole genome data and RNA-seq that the clinicians are trying to interpret. Um, and so it's really trying to link that discovery canvas of the open PBTA to what we know are the modalities that clinicians are using at the front lines when they meet patients. Thank you. Um, and Hendrick says, thank you for the answer in the talk. Uh, the next question comes in from Lindsay, and the question is, how often is new data added to the portal? Yeah, we actually uh, try to add data in as near real time as possible. Um, so just to give you as an example, um, 
uh, that uh, patient that I highlighted um, from a PNOC clinical trial, um, that's an ongoing clinical trial that's taking place right now. Um, that data is already integrated into the open PBTA. And there are various approaches to doing this, um, and there are both um, uh, benefits and uh, challenges in doing that. Our goal is to provide access to provisional data as rapidly as possible and be transparent about the fact that these are the data sets as they are coming in. These are the data sets as we are processing them. And we want you as a community to work with us in that context. That's a very different model than um, most NIH studies, which essentially have data release cycle. So essentially, um, you know, you have a cohort of subjects that is um, curated, analyzed, processed, and then on a yearly or multi-year context, there's a data release of highly curated data. We chose as a community to, um, to work through a transparent process where, yes, th there will be a curated, validated, processed data set, um, but everything along the way is also available. And so we really want to engage that early uh, process of discovery, curation, interpretation as rapidly as possible, um, because those are actually challenging things. Um, so our goal is to deposit and make data available as rapidly as possible. And as you saw, uh, each time a group requests specimens uh, for use, so that it's incumbent as part of the process that they uh, sign on to, that when they generate that data, it comes back into the repository. So what you'll see is you know, fairly frequent updates um, and integration of data, clinical data, um, and biospecimen derived analyses uh, into the workflow. Great. I mean, it seems like in today's uh, environment, people, everybody wants instant gratification. So you're trying to, to address that, right? Uh, in part, but in part, we also need people's support, right? These are large data sets. And it turns out that the best way to identify issues with data or interpret them and curate them is to actually use them. Um, and so uh, that's why sort of the open PBTA has really served us amazingly well. And that, even the Childhood Cancer Data Lab has been amazing at this. As we iterate through the data sets, we can improve them, curate them, um, re-annotate them, um, and work through both a data curation analysis and QC process simultaneously, all with the goal of the accelerated discovery process. Okay, so the next question comes from Amber. And Amber says, we're in the early phase of building a pediatric thyroid consortium. And it'd be great to ask some specific questions related to early building and strategic planning. Is there someone that we could email to set up a meeting? Yeah, so please email me directly. Um, and, it, and this is a, a, a very important question. Um, what we found is that it's, there's such value in engaging um, domain experts with a specific focus like thyroid cancer, or um, you can even imagine you know, a specific brain tumor like medulloblastoma or DIPG. You need to, to have a node for that community to aggregate on and commit to and guide in a disease specific way. But what we found doesn't work so much is for each one of those efforts to try to recreate the entirety of the infrastructure from you know, foundation to the highest brick. Um, it's such an expensive and um, um, challenging effort to do in a disease specific way. And so our hope is that any community, um, thyroid or otherwise, could leverage um, the platforms and resources we've created. And so we've tried to make many of these um, uh, very modular. Um, and at the same time, it also allows not only for groups to develop a disease focused effort, but secondarily to interoperate across diseases. Um, and there have been too many lessons that we've learned where simply because data sets were not interoperable or interconnected across variegated domains, uh, as an example, um, 
diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma and uh, fibrodysplasia, cyphocans progressiva. These are two diseases, FOP and DIPG, that have ostensibly nothing to do with each other. One is a rare bone disease and the other one is a horrific brain tumor. But one fifth of patients actually share the exact same mutation between those two. Normally these communities don't interact with each other. The clinicians don't work with each other. And so discovery, however, could be driven across communities. And it, indeed it was. Um, the FOP mutations were discovered in 2006. Um, that data could inform the DAPG efforts um, that really began in 2011, essentially. Um, so uh, please email and um, I'll try not to talk as, as long about the merits of it and really just focus on how we can potentially support your own efforts um, uh, in building a resource. It's, it's incredibly valuable to have domain specific efforts leverage these types of uh, initiatives. And the NIH who's sponsoring the Kids First um, Data Resources is highly advocate of exactly that approach. Great, um, hopefully you have time for one last question. Yep. Um, and the person who asked that question about connecting um, responded exactly our thoughts and we're very excited to collaborate with you. Um, the last question is from Emily Pickle and it says, since regulatory work takes so much time, has the CBTN considered centralized regulatory um, example, central IRB? Yeah, so we, we actually have um, a, a central IRB of record. And, and it's absolutely right that it takes um, a lot of work and effort. Um, the NIH actually now requires a central IRB for NIH funded initiatives exactly for that reason. Um, so all of the institutions within the CBTN essentially follow the same SOPs, same consent workflows uh, moving forward. There's still e existing challenges um, in the IRB process in general uh, between institutions because not all IRBs interpret things equivalently. Um, but this is where patients and communities can be transformational. Um, informed patients can drive the use of their data and specimens in ways that are um, essentially overriding of any interpretive or um, uh, bureaucratic process driven by uh, a regulatory environment. And, and more specifically, um, you know, what the, the Office of Civil Rights um, really made clear over the last couple of years is that patients actually own their clinical data. Patients um, own their healthcare in ways that we as a community need to do a better job of empowering them to inform how they want that data to be used and or specimens empowered. And really this is a, a space where we're spending a tremendous amount of time and effort um, to further develop these portals and environments such that they not only support um, you know, a researcher, but ideally, right, the vision ought to be that they support, fully support a patient's own need to interpret and understand their disease. Now that's a tall order, but it's not impossible. Um, and what we find is that the minute you're diagnosed with a rare disease, many families either become experts or connect to expert families and communities. Um, and so they come in asking you know, very specific questions that we hope portals and environments like this can support them. That's a long way of saying that there's still work to be done on um, optimizing around the regulatory process. Um, but even the NIH, and um, it's certainly true in the EU with the implementation of GDPR, um, have come to recognize that patients ultimately should um, be informed and empower their data and specimens in ways that are aligned with mission. Namely, every patient that we know wants to accelerate the discovery process um, associated with their child's disease. Great, and uh, Emily responded, brilliant solution, agree entirely, families are powerful and this is solvable. So with that, that's the last question, Adam. I wanna thank you again for doing this lecture today. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us and um, hopefully together we can make uh, even bigger difference for these families. I look forward to it. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks, Adam.